Hey. There we go. <laughs> Hello. Look, hey, how's your blood pressure? You doing all right? Man, I don't ever panic. Right. It's a good, you, that's a good thing. Yeah. I mean, you know this, like when something just from doing radio, and I've never done radio, but just with the podcast and doing this stuff, it doesn't do any good to panic and start clicking no. around. I no, just dude. sit patiently and see how things go. <laughs> right. Yeah. I've had those moments where the song stops right in the middle. Yeah. And you just keep going, dude. You act like it never happened. So. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. I mean, worst case scenario, I was thinking I'll just go home for the night. Right. <laughs> right. Um, watch some but America's Got Talent. Who knows? This is a great segue because it's like, what would recovery be for a guy like me if I didn't have things still happen that you consider going wrong, maybe, and you still can, you know, you don't lose your melons over it. Yeah, there you go, man. So uh, here's what I'm going to do, guys. Um, obviously, you've got a lot to share with us over the next half hour. So I'm going to kill my camera so that the show is all you guys. Okay. Um, so share away. And at about 740, we'll switch over to the other Zoom room. And I'll send it to you guys in a message here. Okay, cool. Everybody that's watching so that you've got that info. And then we'll do the live Q&A. And sometimes okay. we've got families that join us for that. Sometimes we don't. Um, so okay. we'll just play it by ear. Cool, brother. Thank you, man. All right. The Mullings family, everybody. Yeah. All right. I'm back. This is my lovely mom, Tease. And uh, thanks for having us. What a what a, a privilege for us to finally be able to do this. Uh, and technical difficulties at first, but we made it. So um, my uh, sobriety date is 12-22-2016. Uh, uh, so coming up on four years. God willing, I'll have four years sober um, on uh, this December 22nd, which has gone by fairly, fairly fast, I guess. Yes. Fairly yes. Fast. Mm -hmm. uh, but the cool thing about doing this is that I've shared my story a lot of times and um, mine is one of like social drinker became kind of survival drinker. So I did things that I never really would think that I would do. Like the second my feet hit the floor, I would, you know, reach open the refrigerator to grab a beer or I would hide things around the house constantly, or I'd come over to my parents' house and visit. But I knew that I could have access to what, wherever they had, or even my brother's house. I mean, uh, you're a guy, I got caught in my brother's closet. You know, I tell you this, Matt caught me in the closet. Yes. <laughs> caught me in the closet trying to have a drink out of his stuff that he had there. So, um, but survival drinker became, uh, or social drinker became survival drinker. Uh, it, it was about 16 years or so that I, uh, that I had started drinking. Like, I guess you could say my drinking career was about 16 years long or so, but it started out as just like a social lubricant. Uh, I was in radio for 20 years. Now, radio is not the reason why I, I had a drinking problem, but it made it rather easy to get a hold of it. I mean, I got into radio really young, and so you were kind of introduced to it. And then uh, the way that my career was, I sort of felt like it was a rite of passage. Like I'd go to concerts and I'd sit in the VIP section, and then, you know, you couldn't have a good time without having a drink. And it's so funny. Tim Allen, I love Tim Allen. Oh, you, you like Tim Allen too, right? Mm -hmm. Tim Allen says that he, uh, his story, he's got a powerful story, but he says that he always used to associate drinking with a fun time. And he's like, I never, I couldn't be any further from the truth. So and that's kind of like what my deal would be. Did you, were you going to say something? Uh, no, go ahead. Oh, well, yeah. So I, it, that's kind of the, the really quickly, the cliff notes of it. So I, I ran it really hard. I turned into the alcoholic and I ever thought I would be, I was hiding it. I was uh, broke, busted, not to be trusted. I was lying to people that I cared about and I was going just really nowhere really fast. And so um, I ended up calling 911 on the night that I was my rock bottom. I called 911. I didn't say, I said I wasn't hostile. I said I wouldn't be combative. I just said I didn't feel right. And I knew mentally something was not okay. And I kept talking to mom about it. And so uh, I wish I could tell you what made me do it, but I called 911 and these officers came out and thank thankfully, these guys knew how to handle the crisis situation I was in. I wasn't like, I didn't have a weapon out or anything like that, but they just sat down, talked to me, and then took me to a place where I needed to go. I detoxed at the ER, and then I ended up going to the mental um, facility for St. Anthony's, and I was there. This was Christmas weekend of 2016, so if you're going to really mess things up, that's a really good time <laughs> to do it. It was not. It was the weekend with my daughter and my wife now, my fiance then. She had done all the Christmas shopping, so I really put a wrench in everything, but um, I was there on a Friday night, I remember, and it was, uh, it was December 23rd, and this lady came to see me um, and brought me a prayer book. And so this prayer book, I wish I still had it. I don't have it. You don't have it. No, I called them to see if they'd have it, but they never had well, it. Well, somebody else is using it. I know, yeah. But I, but I didn't read um, front to back. I wish I could told you I did, but what I did is I thumbed through, and I read um, everything in red. And just, I mean, I tried to absorb this book, and I... And when I fell asleep, I held it like I was, it was my favorite little 
a blankie or something. And, and I really truly believe that that morning is when, uh, as I say, I, like I always, I always felt like I had this tight rope relationship with God. Like you'd hear God loves you and it kind of looked like it belonged on a coaster or a koozie or a coffee mug or something like that, but it never applied to me. And, uh, and so that time in that um, St. Anthony's in the mental room, I really realized, you know, that God did love me. And, and I kind of, I think for my spiritual walk, it changed when I, when I told him I would love him back. So for me, that's where the way it started to happen. Well, and for um, his family and I, we, uh, we, uh, he grew up with liquor in the house. Um, my, um, his dad, my husband, he uh, uh, always had liquor in the house, but he would hide it because there were five children. We had five and seven years. And so uh, he would hide it. Um, and uh, I know that that became a joke uh, later when they were adults to tell us, yeah, we found that a long time right, ago, you, you know, the hiding place. But <laughs> but I was raised in a Southern Baptist home and you just didn't drink. It was against the rules. And so uh, uh, we were not aware. I mean, when McLean became older and a young adult, and uh, it, we were not surprised that he um, would have some drinks. Mm -hmm. Um, out with friends, those kinds of things. Um, and we were totally unaware that it was a problem until he moved from Tulsa back to Oklahoma City. Mm -hmm. So while he was living in Tulsa, of course, we didn't see him every day, didn't necessarily talk to him every day, but almost, but... Um, and we knew that he was holding down uh, two jobs and he had a, uh, a young uh, child. And so I think that on our part, we were just pretty much oblivious uh, that there was a problem. And then once he moved from Tulsa back to Oklahoma City and uh, he lived with... Um, his dad and I, uh, for a few weeks until he could find his own place to live. Then it became more apparent mm -hmm. that there was something going on. So, uh, but still, we still didn't know to the degree that it had, uh, had gone to. So really, we had several deaths in the family. Um, my, his grandmother uh, in May of 2016, um, uh, an aunt in October of 2016, then his grandfather, April of 2017, his dad in December of 2017. And so we just had a, a, a run Hard, yeah. of some difficult uh, times. And so that became more apparent as well um, that he was drinking, not just socially, but all the time. Yeah. He, he, he would drink, start drinking in the morning and pretty much drink all day. And that kind of, you would talk to him on the phone or something that kind of put him in a, oh, well, <laughs> kind of an attitude. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, and uh, I'm sure he was doing that because he had a lot of, there was a lot of grief involved. Mm -hmm. And, um, but then his siblings, all, uh, all of who live here. And then his siblings started noticing that when we would have football games at different houses, basketball games at different homes, that um, uh, he, was, he was drinking quite a bit. And yes, it came to the fact, to the, it came to the point where over at 
his older brother's house one one time, he actually went upstairs and went through their room yeah. <laughs> looking for uh, where he put the uh, liquor. liquor yeah. And uh, his older brother caught him up there. What are you doing? You know, so that really then um, confirmed to all of us that this was a problem. It was a problem because he was drinking any time of day. And also he was uh, trying to hide some of it. And he was also, um, um, you know, going behind people's back yeah, to yeah. get it. And so that's, that's when we really became aware that he had a problem. Yeah, that's a good, uh, I was, let's see, I, I got laid off um from one of the radio gigs uh june of 2015 that's when the, i actually had moved out of the house that i was in with my oldest daughter's mom too so i had kind of had the grief of losing the job and then the grief of you know I had relationships and financial things and jobs and all kinds of stuff that was going wrong but um for me i noticed it too when i moved from oklahoma city to los angeles and i moved down there i got really homesick mm -hmm. and so it started then and then the guilt of it didn't work out how I wanted it to work out when I was in LA because I had all these standards and expectations, but she's right. And fast forward to 2015, I, um, had gotten laid off again. Like I'd been laid off three times and it's just part of the deal budget cuts. But, um, when my grandmother fell in January of 16, I, I was I actually got fired. Um, and it wasn't because they knew I was drinking, but it was as a result, the result of my drinking because I was late again. So it was sort of like the straw that finally broke the camel's back, if you will. My apologies to camels. But I, uh, my grandmother fell and I moved here. And then so when, when uh, Nini had her thing, I didn't know how to deal with that at all. No. And then, um, and then with uh, the aunt in October, I, and I thought I would be able to handle my grandmother, but no, not a chance. And then... Um, so I, I sobered up. So when, when my grandfather passed away, I had four months of sobriety and was able to talk to him and be with him in the bed or, you know, in the room and be accountable and try to see what everybody needed. And, and I always say, like, even though that's a very tragic thing to happen, it was still pretty beautiful, though, because I get to hold his hand and everything. Yes. And he was like one of my biggest fans, too. So it was great to be able to be sober then. But. And he it was a real um, test for him. Uh, if you want to put it that way, um, when his dad died uh, unexpectedly here at the house on December 23rd of 2017, and uh, uh, his birthday was, he was a Christmas baby. And so two days before his birthday, uh, McLean went to Tulsa to see his wife's uh, family. And, uh, and we had to call him and tell him mm -hmm. uh, on the turnpike that his dad has, his dad had passed away. And so um, I think that was difficult for him in that he wasn't here and he, he didn't get to spend those last moments with yeah. him. Um, but, uh, and, and I think in some ways he still, He's still having to deal with that. But on the positive side, that would have been an easy, easy excuse mm -hmm. to um, to have a drink or two. No, it really would have, yeah. 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 And uh, uh, so I have to I have to say that he he has been, once he made up his mind um, that he was not gonna drink anymore because it was not worth it yeah uh and didn't match his goals in life and uh that he really made a commitment to it and i i also think that it's just like each one of your children have a little different personalities what works if for uh, discipline for one doesn't work for the other one and you have to, so i think that uh it's the same way with any of the, any addiction, regardless of what it is. Um, some people just have to really, what they call 
hit bottom and they can hit bottom multiple times. And, and you, every time you think, oh, mm -hmm. that's the one, that's, that's the one. Yeah. Yeah. But I have to say with McLean that uh, when he called me that night and said he was having some pretty bad thoughts, um, and what should he do? And uh, I said, then you should call 911 and um, uh, tell them that and let them take you um, somewhere um, where you can be helped. Yeah. And so that is what he did. I don't think he quite expected what occurred no. once that happened, uh, but I think it was, for him anyway, it was enough of an eye-opener to say, what am I doing? Mm -hmm. And do I want to do this off and on uh, all my life yeah because that's what he was looking at so no that was it that's great too because i it definitely wasn't what i expected i didn't expect to well i didn't even know where they were they took me to the er i knew that and then i was detoxing there but i had no idea what my blood alcohol level was or anything like that but then i think it kind of really started to sink in when they moved me from the bed that i was in because when i heard i was when they told me i was on that detention emergency mm -hmm. uh emergency detention yeah order. that's when i was like wait a minute man i can't leave and so maybe i threw a little attitude i don't remember i can't confirm nor deny uh and so they moved me from that room and then i went into a, a lobby area with the lights off and had like a pillow and i slept on a plastic couch and that's when like it started to really really sink in that this was a path that i didn't want to be going down and, and if i continued it was going to be you know, I, they brought me something to eat as a sandwich in one of those boxes. And it had like a juice cup, you know, the pineapple juice or whatever it is. And so it was a dry sandwich. And I remember looking down at it in this dark room. And I've always been one to like kind of take note of things and all that. So I looked down and the first thing I thought of was like, if I go to jail, this is what I'll be eating. <laughs> if I go to like prison or something, get used to this. And it was a dry sandwich and everything. But um, but yeah, the grief top notch. Or she's explained it perfectly as... as when dad passed away the day after my one year sobriety, there's a reason why I wasn't here. I wouldn't be able to handle it, I don't think. It would have been too hard, probably. It, it was because he, we uh, had to call 911 here. We had started CPR. Uh, the, the paramedics got here. The police got here. It, uh, his dad was very peaceful. Mm. His dad was very peaceful. We had just put him in bed and got him all covered up and he just closed his eyes and was gone but uh we uh so we did attempt to um revive him but it it was an emotional thing and it was an emergency thing and it was so uh, it it you know um God has plans yeah. and he uh, knows what people can handle well and what they can't. And so, um, and I can say that even with my diagnosis of, um, it'll be two, it's, in fact, it's two years. That's right. Uh -huh, uh, of uh, stage four metastatic breast cancer. Um, I had, uh, when I signed my DNR and when I made out who was going to be able to make medical decisions for me, I told McLean, I said, I, I don't want you, I don't want to hurt your feelings by having you not participate in that, no. but um, I don't think that that would be something that you would be comfortable with making those kinds of decisions. And I also... Uh, don't want you to have that burden to carry with you. Yeah. And so, and, and, and he agreed. Yeah, I do. And so, you know, he has older siblings that can deal with that. And I'm not saying that he's a weak person. Right. But I, I'm just saying that um, if you know that something can be an issue for you, if something can be a, a stumbling block for you, yeah. then you don't need to take those kind of 
chances. And if, if you're in a, a family that pays attention and knows you, then, then uh, the family can help with uh, uh, jumping over the stumbling yeah. blocks so that you don't fall. I call them guardrails. Guardrails. Yeah, I like to call them guardrails. Okay. It's no, but you're right. It's even the, and I love it. That, like God has a plan too, because with my grandmother, I wasn't there. I missed it, and I think that, I, although I wasn't sober, and it took me, well, what seven months to get seven months later, but, um, but that would have been too hard for me to be in the room when she did. I know that, or especially with Dad here. So grief was one of my things that I had no idea how to deal with grief, whether it was the loss of a loved one, or like I said, a relationship or a job or any other things I'd been through marriages that didn't, you know, that we just didn't work out and things like that. So I carried all of that. And I really didn't put too much thought into that. God does have a plan. And here's the cool thing too, about dad, he passed the day after my one year sobriety. But the good thing is that I got to see him uh, on the day before he passed away. Cause I went to a place in Purcell called Rob's ranch. I got my one year coin, sobriety coin. I came here showed mom and showed him and got to see him and everything. So that's the good thing is that I got to experience all of that. Yes. And uh, uh, his dad got to wear, every time he talked to him on the phone or every time he saw him, one of the last things he would say is, I'm proud of you. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, and he was, and he was, so. Yeah, he did. He always, he always, he made me cry on this parents helping parents thing. <laughs> oh, no. Uh, but yeah, the good thing is the guardrail. So for me personally, with my sobriety, I make sure I just don't put myself in situations, but the community is big. I could talk to my mom about things. I could talk to, uh, I've mentored several of them. You, they say you have an A team. So I've got five guys that I could call anytime, any day, doesn't matter when it is and talk to them about things that are going, uh, not going for me or wherever I'm at, as far as my attitude goes you know we always your, your amigo your ego is not your amigo and i know that i have one if i let it get in the way and start wanting to do things that i want to do it then it it doesn't work out i, I constantly have to move out of god's way and let him do it mm -hmm. let him control it and in some ways you as a parent i mean you your goal is to raise this child so that they become an independent um productive adult and so um, that's what you strive for. And there are going to be issues that come up mm -hmm. on their journey uh, to attain that. And, uh, and so this was what one of his issues, one of his major issue yeah. uh, as an adult. And so, uh, yes, I'm very proud of him. Well, thank you. You're I'm welcome. trying to, think, yeah, it. it never did i expect it i mean I, if there's somebody nobody i never planned if you would asked me when i was nine i wanted to be the next john elway i didn't want to be you know 36 and uh, addicted to alcohol i mean that was it's not that we planned to do this kind of stuff but um you know these the higher power whether that however that higher power is i you know there's many different ways you can get to texas uh, if that makes any sense so somebody might go to aa and it might work for them or they might try to do uh, some sort of other program or or something like that that works better for them i think that when i first tried to get sober i ran into a lot of people that would be like well there's one way and if you don't do it i'm going to tell these young people how it is and well then that doesn't do anything i mean it didn't help me but I, but there's several different but the most important thing that the what's i say the most of all is love what's that bible verse the most important one is love mm -hmm. corinthians right yes yeah corinthians. There you go. Mm -hmm. yeah yeah but unconditional love is what this lady's given me. So, <laughs> well, and uh, yes, you know, uh, faith has been um, uh, one of the the major. Oh, what do you want to? How do you want to say? The major influence yeah. uh, upon myself and um, my husband, and uh, and so. Um, I think it's a matter of, of, like I said, they're on their own journeys mm -hmm. and um, their journeys uh, can be kind of rough sometimes, but I've, uh, I've never been very good at um, 
at tough love. <laughs> it's just not in my nature. Yeah. <laughs> and so that, that was very hard. And really with McLean, it wasn't, um, uh, it didn't take a lot of tough love. I mean, it, it took his siblings uh, uh, saying, you have a problem. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, point, yeah. and it, it took a, an experience of, I might just walk into that lake. Mm -hmm. and uh and uh, being able to uh say no I, I need help yeah so you know you have to uh you have to give someone credit for um, some people say coming to their senses but i i think it's coming to the point where this is this is a decision that determines how my life is going to be yeah. Yeah. and what I want for my life and my ch my children and family sick and tired of being sick and tired yes that's what I was yeah mm -hmm. you know what it, oh good you're gonna say something else oh no um so I have a I have a how old is she now? what's today the July 6th so Amelia will be what, 21 months old in four days right mm -hmm. 21 so I've got so I have an eight-year-old that my dad met and everything and then i have so after dad passed away two months after he passed away we did the ultrasound to find out what we know now is my daughter the other daughter but that was another one of the blessings that we had little god winks i call them and stuff so because two days or two two months after dad passed away february 23rd we went to the doctor to hear the heartbeat uh i was literally leaving the cemetery where my dad is uh when my wife had called me and said that she was pregnant so that was kind of cool i was visiting dad and then the next thing you know, i get a call about hey He's going to be a grandpa again. Crazy. He, and so that can be tough too, is that he never met. Uh, I know he knows her, but he, but he's not here physically to, to see Amelia, my, my uh, almost two year old. And then now we're uh, expecting another baby that'll be here in December. And so that it, it's, I was thinking about it today. It's not, doesn't, it's not like crippling or very um, super hard, but it's tough to think about that. He's not here. For well, it, it's a, it's a sadness, but it's a, um, a sadness that is expected. Yeah. Uh, when you think of him, oh, he would have loved this baby. He would have loved this. He would have loved that. Um, and that's all true. But we believe that he's he's still here with us, mm -hmm. and so he's really not missing out on anything. On the other hand, McLean. Uh, he would be missing out on a whole lot. Yeah, right. Yeah, I yeah. would. I would. And I think the th things come full circle. So, because I started this last week a new job with the uh, Oklahoma Criminal Justice Authority, and I work at the Oklahoma County Detention Center. I work at the jail, which I made the joke when I went into HR and filled out my paperwork. I said, you know, uh, when I was drinking, there probably, I knew there was a chance I was going to see this building. It just depended on, you know, now I'm seeing it on the other side as opposed to where I was kind of heading to. And, and uh, but God is good. That's all I know is, uh, is and, uh, one at a time. And there's been uh, almost 1300 days since one at a time, which is crazy. I can't believe that. So, because mm -hmm, mm -hmm. something I used to do all the time, like this is water, obviously, but I used to just like that, I would have cups of stuff laying around. Wouldn't eat. I'd be sick constantly, but thank God I don't do it anymore. So I guess Derek will hop in when, when we're wrapping up. Are we, are you, do you hop back in, Derek? Uh, yeah, man, I was just waiting on you guys. Okay, brother. Uh, oh, okay. Well, yeah, yeah, man. Kinda, no, I mean, you, not that, not that you, you gotta, went too long. That's not you what gotta I tell us. You got to tell us to be quiet. You're talking to a guy that's been in communication. <laughs> <laughs> He was no man, you guys, you guys were good. Um, I'd sent you a message that said we still had a couple of minutes, but um, when he was when he was little, we always knew that he was going to uh, uh, have a career that required talking. Talking, man, because sure, uh, his dad would say, "McLean, five minutes, give me five minutes." And now it's full circle, man. <laughs> it's full. My right? eight year old, I'm like, dude, King's X, you got to let me just hang out for five minutes and not talk. <laughs> Yeah, I, uh, I actually did a, a, I was a guest on another podcast today that does video as well. Um, and they're like, oh man, I listen to your podcast. You have such a great podcast voice. And I was like, yeah, but I was built for radio. Oh, you're not, yeah, 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 I don't need any of this video stuff, right? 
You do. So. You do have a killer podcast, man. That's, I'm not just saying that. I've enjoyed oh, pre- pre- Yeah, appreciate that, man. I'll have to yeah. have you come on sometime. Yeah, I'm yeah. Sure we could fill up two hours pretty fast. So I'd love to, bro. Um, so we're gonna step into our live Q and A. So uh, Mac, I sent you a message here on Zoom that's got that info in it. If you'll be jotting that down real quick. Okay. If you are watching live on Facebook, I have uh, added it in the comment section. You can also find it other places on our Facebook page and on our website uh, as well if you need to. So as soon as Matt gives me the go ahead that he's got that written down, I'm going to kill this meeting and I'm going to switch over uh, into the live Q&A meeting and any parents or people that are watching are welcome to join us and ask Matt and his wonderful mom any questions that they have on their mind. I got it, man. I'm good. All right. I will see everybody in the next room. Thank you. All right, brother.